Um, so we're still working on that. There are some interesting things, and there's a lot of astrology, you know, ethical charges that say, oh, you shouldn't predict the length of life, which is kind of ridiculous because most modern astrologers don't have the tools to do it. You know, the ancients had better tools, but uh, it's kind of presumptuous of them, in, in fact. But in any case, so this is a way you can actually start to suss out each of the um, houses and see what the person's fate is. But you have to then be able to tell the conditions of these planets. So a little bit of an aside, but I think it's interesting. And that's how the elements started to be woven in and worked with both this doctrine of is it a night chart or a day chart? Okay? Pretty cool, I think. All right? And giving you a little bit more predictive power. Um, in the right-hand corner here is just another way of seeing the triplicity rulers, by the way. Um, you'll see that they have one, two, and three down here. The one on the left is day, and the one on the right is night. And you just go in those orders, and you can make that out. All right? So, let's look again at this. The ancients had this idea that there were four humors, all right? And I don't mean like good humor candy or, or ice cream. They looked at personalities and how these things fit together. And you are said to be a balance of these things. So anybody remember what this one is? Sanguine. And it's principle was blood. Latin blood, right? Okay. Down here was the phlegmatic type or <coughs> phlegm. Okay. Down here Melancholia. is melancholic or in modern parlance passive aggressive asshole. <laughs> Melancholics get really a lot of crap lately, but I'll get into that. I'm actually a melancholic type. And up here, we have the choleric. And these were, you know, things connected with bile and the liver and actually probably, if you get down to it, an excess of shit. Um, so they saw these as balancing. Now, if you were a person of really good health, all of these were balanced in your life. It wasn't that you had an excess, because an excess would lead to ill health. All right? And you could actually tell things about the person. You could see their type. The doctors were trained to look at the body type and how the person presented to tell their main type. And it's basically, it's where you hung out most of the time. Now, there are good and bad things to both of these, as we'll get into in a little bit, all right? But this was really an old, old system, and it was in use for quite some time. Now, of course, the other interesting thing is, when this was in use, so was astrology to diagnose and work with disease. And part of the problem with modern medical astrology is that they have shifted their emphasis. There's a, there's a whole new system, comes from Germany, and they look at planetary combinations and how they're connected in and whatnot. But when we try and understand the older medical astrology, we wind up being lost unless we understand the four humors and the fact that they were treating these things and not pneumonia or some specific disease that we have a label for now which is why you want to look at the energetics of the herbs and things like that. Because they had an energetic system very similar to like traditional Chinese medicine, all right? Uh, it so happens that my main spiritual teacher is an expert at traditional Chinese medicine, and she's grafted those um, properties of herbs onto Western herbs. So she's going to be coming out with a Materia Medica telling Chinese practitioners how to use Western herbs and combining the two of them. You know, But she's also learned the traditional Western system too, 
But a lot of that stuff has actually been lost, and she's trying to kind of recreate it, and she's actually found a lot of interesting interconnections, but I won't go there. So now we start to get this a little bit more figured out. We've got these nice terms, you know, sanguinous personality and phlegmatic, and every once in a while, especially for people who are overeducated, you'll hear them using these terms, okay? They're not much in, in use in uh, modern life. You know, you won't even hear people say jovial that much anymore. But it gives you a little sense of where some of these are. Sanguine, you know, nice and friendly and phlegmatic. And, but let's look at this in another dimension. And for this dimension, I want to introduce you to the second person at the top of that list, okay? If you go to the back of your handout, William Moulton Marston, okay? Basic facts, born in 1893, died in 1947. He actually died fairly young. He accomplished a lot in his life, though. His wife was Elizabeth Holloway, and his polyamorous partner was Olive Byrne. Yes, we have somebody who is a polyamorist in the first half of the 20th century, all right? Uh, so at the at the, at the beginning, we get a sense of, wait, maybe this guy was a little different, all right? Uh, got a BA from Harvard, LLB from Harvard Law School, PhD in psychology from Harvard University, teacher at the American University, and comic book Hall of Fame induction, 2006? Where in the world does that fit in? <laughs> okay, so we have somebody connected to comic books, and he's a psychologist and a lawyer? What, what's What's happening? Well, Marston was really interested in the basics of personality and where do we get it from. So some of his psychological work was in this book, which in the lower left is the Emotions of Normal People. Here's an edition you can actually find. Uh, I got this over the net and it is still in print, Emotions of Normal People. Uh, this was published in 79, but this, the actual book came out much earlier. And he talks about four basic emotions and how they connect in with even the physiology of the person, the motor self, which he talked about. And he had his whole, whole theory of consciousness and all the rest. Now, he worked in this and came out with it, but it was kind of forgotten, okay? What wound up being more important was the fact that one of his wives, I believe it was Olive, had said, uh, gee, my blood pressure goes up when I'm nervous. And he started measuring things, and he started looking at truth and deception. This guy is one of the fathers of the lie detector, modern polygraph. Now, one could argue that Carl Jung also had an influence on it. Okay, for those of you who don't remember, Carl Jung had that whole test, the word association test, and part of what he looked at was how much hesitancy did a person have, and he knew that there were physiological markers, but he didn't really focus in on that, but people started to look at that as part of lie detection too. Now, Marston ran into a few problems, as you can see, okay? Um, he wound up, um, let's see now, his lie detecting machine, in quotes, shows change in respiration. That was another thing he looked at. He was arrested and held on a charge of uh, using uh, the mails to defraud. So he ran into some business deals that were a little bit difficult. I think he shook that one off. There's also somewhere out there, and you can find it on the internet, um, a, 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 an ad where he worked with Gillette razors <laughs> to use his lie detector to show that um, these men weren't lying when they said that it shaved closer. Not a problem that I have, obviously. <laughs> okay, so he was looking for deals and things, you know, trying to keep himself afloat. And in fact, he, he approached the FBI, <laughs> and this is from his um, official file and you can see at the bottom here, and I think this was Hoover that made this note, 
I always thought this fellow Marston was a phony and this proves it. Somebody's opinion about the lie detector. And to, to be fair, there's still a lot of controversy. Do these things work? Do they not? Okay. Nevertheless, seeing emotional state from objective things was part of what broke him through. Well, how do we get to Wonder Woman for all things? Well, he was approached and had this idea about a female superhero. So he started to write about that. Now, Wonder Woman was actually based on both of his wives. Apparently one of them more than the other, a certain amount of strength. But we can speculate about certain other things about Marston. For one thing, think about Wonder Woman and her lasso that grabbed people and held them and made them not tell a lie. Wait, what? That sounds familiar. Okay. Um, bracelets and a certain amount of strength in a woman. And I point you to this little excerpt from, um, uh, from one of the early comics. I can't understand these girls. You could if you knew woman in the man-ruled world. They want to be slaves because they're afraid to be free and compete with men. And then she thinks to herself, if girls want to be slaves, there's no harm in that. The bad thing for them is submitting to a master or an evil mistress like Paula. A good mistress could do wonders for them. <laughs> So we see some interesting themes here of dominance and submission. Intriguing. So let's take a look at our little diagram then with sort of a different viewpoint. We can talk about somebody who's really hot and not in the modern sense of sexuality but hot-tempered, active, and we come up with dominant on this dimension. Cold, withdrawn, submissive. Now, wet and dry, what do we make with that? Well, there's a certain way in which wetness interconnecting has a way of seeing the world in a positive manner or <clears throat> friendly. Seeking social connections. Dry, seeing the world as negative or being a little standoffish or we could say unfriendly. Not, that's a bit of an over, over exaggeration, but Maybe reserved. Reserved would be another, yeah, that would be, uh, in fact, kind of a better term. Introvert, extrovert, perhaps? Not exactly. Um, in, when you're talking introversion and extroversion, you're really talking about whether the person is drained from being social or gets um, energy from being social. You could think, though, there is a certain amount, and, th and this is kind of interesting. I mean, if they're friendly, they're going to seek out more social stuff. So there's good possibilities that these probably overlap quite a bit, okay? Now, if you start to look at this, you start to think, oh, okay, so what would these be like personality-wise? Well, if dominance and friendly come up here, what would be some good archetypes or examples for this quarter? Who do you think of as dominant and friendly? John F. Kennedy. A lot of politicians, yes. Kennedy would be one. I won't even bother writing these. Who else? Clergy. Clergy, oftentimes, although not exclusively. Well, how about... Jo Joey is clergy. Uh, how, about, how about two people that basically got elected the same way, but from different political parties? Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama. I was going to say Reagan. We can do it. We're Americans. We're wonderful. Think about it. Reagan's whole thing was, I'm your friendly Irish grandfather. Okay? We can do it. We're Americans. We're wonderful. Okay? The great communicator. 
you know? Now, policies are another thing entirely, and one could argue the same for Obama. But Obama was like, we are the people that we're, we've been waiting for, you know? And look at the enthusiasm that came up as a result of that, all right? So, you know, if we're doing other kinds of archetypes, um, an animal that might be friendly, but lead you. Um, dogs. Dogs, some dogs. Other dogs are kind of more slavish. Um, certainly cats would be off in another corner. But, um, but you know, something that's engaging. Maybe a horse, for instance, you know, carries you and takes you places. Now, down here, we have submissive and friendly. Now, here's another thing about dominance and submission. What does somebody who's dominant, how do they react to their environment? Proactive. Confident. Yeah, they take charge. They will make the environment work for them. Submissive means you adapt to the environment. Okay? Just like the Borg used to say, you will adapt. You know, you'll take it on. Because the Borg, for those Trekkies out there, if you were part of the collective, you were part of something bigger, so you were automatically submissive, all right? So if we have submissive and friendly, what would we have here as examples? Hookers. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah. Depending again on the hooker. Yeah. Right, right. And the price. How about a kitten? Um. Mm. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things is, if you get somebody, and I've heard of this having been done, you get somebody who's psychotic in a rage, and they're in the padded cell and still going crazy and everything, I've heard of them tossing in a kitten. <laughs> and what's gonna happen? Counting the kitten, the, who's, why would they see the kitten as threatening? It calms the person down, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But a kitten. Now, the, my favorite example here is the little old man in the hospital that all the nurses love. He gets the barium enema by mistake and says, oh, it's all right, sweetie. We had to clean it out anyway. OK? <laughs> Submissive but friendly. OK? Now, up here, we have hot dominant Dry, unfriendly. Margaret Thatcher. Very good. How about <laughs> the bouncer in your bar? I'll be friendly. Okay. Well, they could be, but there, there's the possibility they'd be over here. How about George Bush? There are evil people in the world, and I'll protect you from them. Okay. Mostly any leader who's going to be fear-based or saying we're watching out for something, in the most extreme, if we go way off the chart, we have Adolf Hitler, but he scared everybody and said, I will protect you from these evil people who are destroying society, etc." Okay? Down here, my favorite. Cold, submissive, and dry. Now, I'll tell you a little story from my family. <laughs> my father said that he had heard from his father this one phrase, and it really kind of tells the story of the men in the Salmi side of the family because my grandfather said to my father and my father said to me, you can get used to anything. You can even get used to an icicle up your butt if you have enough determination. Now, how much of a submissive <coughs> and the world is bad comment is that? Think about it, okay? Here also, for an archetype, you have like the alley cat, okay? Scared of everything, slinking around, all right? Doesn't have any power, okay? What power it has comes from being really wary and watching out, okay? So we have these four. And I'll get to the interaction in just a minute. But one of the things about this is you can spot it relatively quickly. All right? You can notice as somebody comes into the room. All right? Now, let me reference the next <coughs> page here. Take a look at the one where it says, what do the letters mean?
this comes from Marston, but they've changed the names a little bit, okay? Um, I think his steadiness wound up be, was actually submissive, and I forget what he called conscientious, but it was, um, it was something else that was uh, less politically correct. These dimensions here, dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness, this is called the DISC model. Okay, have folks heard of this? Guess where it comes from? Okay, Marston reinvented the four humors because he looked at the basic emotions that people have and he said there are four. Everything flows out from this. There are people today making thousands of dollars in doing business consulting with the four humors, with something that goes back to our ancient traditions of Hermeticism and Greek thought. Think about that. Isn't that a little interesting? My okay. company paid up somebody a lot of money to come in and do it. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's good information, too. So let's look at this. D, dominance, emphasis on shaping the environment, overcoming opposition, okay? Get immediate results, take action, challenge self and others. Influence, okay, here's the friendly side. Emphasis on shaping the environment, influence or persuading others. Okay, these are your diplomatic people. This would be the, the dude who goes in the hostage crisis and, and uh, talks to you know, the person holding the hostage. Steadiness, okay, emphasis on cooperating with others within existing circumstances to carry out the task, okay? So they're not going to be as proactive, but they'll be good at building the cooperation and they'll be the, but in the extreme, this is the person in the office that everybody gives the job to because they'll do it and they get overburdened, okay? Conscientiousness, emphasis on working conscientiously within existing circumstances to ensure quality and accuracy, okay? Now, that's the melancholic type. Um, this is interesting because how many people here, and I'm expecting with this crowd, it would be a positive answer, pretty good. Uh, have you heard of a guy named Marsilio Ficino? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody remember the big book that he wrote? Three Books on Life. And guess what it was? It was largely how to work with melancholic types and make them feel better. <laughs> it was the first manual for occupational medicine because the melancholic types were the academics, okay? Think about this, you are dry, you're reading dry literature, okay? You're picking things apart to see the particulars, okay? This is Western science at its top, the compartmentalization, you know, the reductionism into parts, the making arguments and defending your position, all right? Do you think you have a lot of power in the world and are really active in the world? Not as much. You're leaning back to discover and use your knowledge as the way to adapt and figure out what's up. Okay? So, Ficino did his three books on life, and yes, he put a lot of stuff in there, but he actually did allopathic medicine. He said, okay, if you're too melancholic, go out and go into beautiful gardens, listen to, um, you know, beautiful music, and um, suckle on the breast of a young mother because there's Venusian um, uh, characteristics there that will help to balance things off. Get your nose out of a book and live life for once? Uh, in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a good I'm summary. Sorry, into something else. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, another page turner. Right, right. <laughs> in any case. But, you know, once again, we have this whole thing popping up in another place in the Western tradition, you know? Isn't this cool how these things are coming together? Even Wonder Woman, okay? <laughs> so, now let's take a look at a little bit more at some of what, what is this, how does this fit, and what are a little bit more in the characteristics. Now, this book, People Smarts, Bending the Golden Rule to Give Others What They Want, um, these guys couldn't use DISC because it's trademarked. So they gave it different names. But how do you quickly spot these, okay? Well, one of the things is they say direct and indirect behaviors, okay? So basically they're talking dominance and submission, okay? Indirect, 
Ah, they approach risk slowly, cautiously, making qualified statements, I mm, think so, asking questions for clarification, reserving expression of opinions, shaking hands gently, okay, making intermittent eye contact, direct, approaching risk spontaneously, contributing frequently to group conversations, using gestures and voice intonation frequently, asking questions rhetorically, introducing oneself, shaking hands firmly. Okay, there's a <coughs> bunch here, but you get the idea, okay? Start to think which one of these are you, all right? And then we'll get to even more specific. Now, these guys have this other dimension. They say <coughs> open behaviors, self-contained <coughs> behaviors, supporting or controlling. Now listen to these and see which of these you think you are. Open, showing and sharing feelings freely, making decisions based on feelings, digressing in conversations, being easy to get to know, appearing relaxed and warm, shaking hands in a friendly manner, responding to dreams, visions, and concepts, showing a great deal of enthusiasm, self-contained, okay, this is the other side. Are you more showing and sharing feelings in a guarded fashion? Preferring to work independently? Being harder to get to know? Shaking hands in a formal manner? Giving very little nonverbal feedback? Showing not much enthusiasm? Being disciplined about how time is used by others? Okay? So you're starting to get a sense? Okay, first thing. Are you more on the open supporting side or the self-contained side? All right. And where do you fit with direct versus indirect, dominance or submission? All right. Now, if you get a general sense this is where I hang out, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be in these other ones at times. Okay. Even the most melancholic person, if they're faced with a kitten, they're going to act differently. Okay. You know. But it's where we have our tendency. And this is going into what's called temperament theory. Now, it's been interesting because recently Psychology Today, or no, it was a psychotherapy uh, networker, talked about how temperament is starting to become more used again in psychotherapy. The therapists are now realizing you can't get, get uh, you know, a, a leopard to change its spots people have a certain temperament. So as a melancholic, I could be trained to act the friendly leader, but I'm not going to be there most of the time. Okay. And you have to get the person to realize what their limitations are and their strengths from these models. And it's going to take a little bit of energy to learn to be more in the center and adaptable and everything. My own approach is I try and get people to realize they have choices in life. And the more they realize they have choices, the more open they are in all these different dimensions to be able to express them all. Make sense so far? Okay. By the way, I didn't say this earlier, but if anybody has some questions or something, interject, jump in. Okay, they all let me. Um, you, maybe you'll come to talk about this a little bit later, but aside from the elemental attributions, how does astrology, how does a chart, the person's chart fit in with which quadrant they would fit into? Very good. There are, in fact, complex methods of figuring this out, okay? There are formulas from the ancients of take the um, uh, element of this planet and this planet and with the uh, ruler of the rising sign, and if you have three fiery planets or two fiery planets in your first house, you're gonna be more this way or that way, okay? Uh, when I tell, when I do this talk to astrologers specifically, I tell them, yes, you could look at all of those. On the other hand, you could just probably figure out from, the, from what the person presents relatively quickly. And you can, once you know the symbology of the chart, you can get a sense right away. For instance, it's pretty easy with my chart. I have Capricorn rising and Saturn's in my first house. Okay, so am I gonna be anything other than melancholic? Okay, yes, I've got three planets in Pisces, so you know, I can be watery and such, you know, and if I'm in an intellectual situation, I have Mars in Aquarius. So I can take charge and be opinionated with a hot planet. 
so it can start to inform where you would be in certain circumstances.